Hey, Richard Ames coming to you today from my partially renovated studio where the electrical is done, the lighting is done, and the painting is done, but I'm still waiting on some furniture and a few other key elements before I'm back to 100% fully functional. When I got into the world of writing and producing music 12 to 15 years ago or so, I quickly realized that there are two very different mindsets that I use in that process. One is the jamming slash ideation mindset where I'm trying out musical ideas. And the other is the arrangement slash production mindset where I'm figuring out how to combine those ideas into a coherent whole. And I'm adding things like equalization and compression and other polishing elements that you add to a track in order to turn it into a finished piece of music. Now, not only are those different focus areas associated with different mindsets, they're also associated with different tool sets and even different ergonomic considerations. So an effective studio layout really needs to consider both, and it needs to do so while also considering things like isolation from exterior noise, acoustic treatment, uh, cable runs, and a host of other logistical issues. So what I thought I'd do today is take you through the plan that I came up with to arrange a pretty typical home studio space in a way that makes me as effective as possible in both of those focus areas. I put together a list of requirements to help guide the project and probably more importantly to help define when it's done so that I don't spend way too much time and money on the renovation. And first on that list, of course, is the requirement to have separate work areas for production and jamming. And I've done that by sending them to opposite ends of the room, the production area up at the front of the room where my previous desk was, and I've added a jamming area at the rear of the room. You can see it behind me here, though it's not done because I'm still waiting on some furniture. I'll get into the details of how that's set up when I talk about the layout of the room. A second requirement for me is duplicate computer controls at each end of the room. So whether I'm at the production station or at the jamming station, I have full control of the computer and the DAW, and I can work equivalently from either one. Another requirement I have, of course, is acoustic treatment, uh, but I had that in the previous room, so that all transfers over. There's nothing new to add there. I've set up the new room so that it uses the existing acoustic treatment. Uh, another requirement that I have is minimal clutter. Whatever I'm not using, I like to have out of the way and out of sight. So I'll pull out the synthesizers and effects units that I need on a particular track. I'll work with those, but I don't like to see them, you know, the, the floor to ceiling racks of synthesizers and effects units. That's too much visual clutter for me. I, I don't like the look of that. So I wanted furniture and other storage elements that allow me to take those synths and effects units and put them away out of view when they're not in use. Likewise, I designed the furniture such that cable runs behind desks, and then I added some features uh, to the room such that uh, cable runs along the floor are all hidden. So all of that stuff is hidden out of view, reduces the amount of visual clutter. Now, the last requirement that I have is going to sound a little odd, but stick with me. And that's crotch protection. Now, if you think about how you sit at a desk comfortably, there's some height at which you like to have your arms so that the strain on your shoulders and your neck is minimized and you can work for longer periods of time comfortably. For me, that turns out to be about a 30 inch desk height, 29, 30 inches, somewhere around there. If that desk height is 29 or 30 inches, the keyboard, uh, computer keyboard and the mouse feel very comfortable for, uh, to me and I can work for extended periods of time that way. Now, as I'm sitting there comfortably at that 30 inch height, there's about a four inch gap between the bottom of the main work desk and the top of my thigh. Now, in order to fit a MIDI keyboard in there underneath that main work area, you need probably at least six inches. You can maybe get by with five, but that's going to really limit your choices on the kinds of MIDI keyboards and synthesizers you can put down there. So if you do that math of I've got four inches of clearance for comfort, but I require six inches of clearance for a keyboard under there, they don't match up and something's getting squashed. OK, so I've come up with a solution for that. And I'll get into the details on that when we get to that section. It involves the design of the desk. But basically what I've done is I've set up the two work areas so that the heights of the work areas are optimized for what I do most of the time in that work area. So in the production work area, 
I spend maybe only 10% of my time using the MIDI keyboard, 90% of my time using the computer keyboard and the mouse. So the desk height is at a height that is most comfortable for the computer keyboard and the mouse. Likewise, at the jamming end of the room, I've set up that desk height so that the MIDI keyboard heights and the synthesizer keyboard heights are comfortable when you're playing because I spend 80 or 90% of my time at that end of the room in that type of scenario. So let's get into the details of the layout of the room and let me explain how I set it up to address all of these requirements. The space that I have to work with is roughly 10 feet by 13 feet. It's got one exterior wall, one wall shared with the garage, and the other two walls are shared with other interior rooms in my house, one of which is this utility room where I keep my slave PCs. Now, the reason I keep my computers outside of the studio is I've tried all of the computer silencing techniques, and even with a fanless computer, there's still coil whine from the power supply and other electrical noise that at least I can hear. Um, so the best solution that I've found is to keep everything outside of the studio, cut a hole in the wall, and run the cables back in. So the old studio is configured figured that way, I've carried that over into the new studio as well. Uh, the previous location of my desk was up here at the top of this image. That's where I'm going to have the main listening location, the production slash arrangement location with the monitors. And that's also why the master PC is located right here. If I had tried to put the master PC in the same location as the slave PCs, I would have had to have run a 35 or 40 foot video cable to get to that main work area. And if you're trying to run 4K at 60 hertz, a 35 or 40 foot cable length gets a little bit dicey. So it's much better to keep the master PC a bit closer to that main workstation location. And even to the back of the room where I'm gonna have another uh, monitor, uh, computer keyboard and mouse setup, that's only about a 20 foot cable run back to there. So that's very doable. Um, there's a large window on the west side of this studio. That's very nice. We have beautiful sunsets here in Tucson. So I'm able to see those from the studio. And this is certainly not an ideal space, but I have found that with some acoustic treatment, it is workable. So as I mentioned, the main desk area is up here at the top of this image. That's where it was in the previous studio. I'm carrying that over for the production slash arrangement work area in the new studio. I've got a new desk coming. It'll be 75 inches wide by 34 inches deep. That puts the main listening position right here. And then I'm adding this 124 inch wide by 26 inch deep workbench at the rear of the room. And what that'll do will, will, will provide a large flat surface that I can use for the jamming area where I can lay out uh, different synthesizers, different effects units, patch things together, try out musical ideas, do some sound design, all of those sorts of things. It also serves double duty as a storage area because beneath that workbench, I have a series of drawers that are sized appropriately for 61 key keyboards. So whatever is not in use on the current project, I can stash in those drawers and keep them out of sight. As I mentioned, the acoustics of this room are not great, so it definitely needs acoustic treatment. I've carried that over from my previous studio setup. The acoustic panels I have are made of Owens Corning 703 rigid fiberglass. They're 24 by 48 inch panels that are three inches thick. And I've got double thickness panels at all locations except the immediate left and right of the listening location where they're single thickness three inch panels. As with most rooms of this size, bass is the primary concern. So I've got bass traps in every corner. At the front of the room, the bass traps run from floor to ceiling. And at the rear of the room, the bass traps run from bench top to ceiling. You can see this acoustic panel behind me right here has a gap between it and the ceiling. That's because that workbench is not yet installed. Once it is, that panel will be placed on top of it and that gap will be closed as the, the panel is placed on top of that bench. So I also have absorbers at the first reflection points, left and right of the main listening location and above hanging from the ceiling. Um, there's a rug on the floor. A rug's not con uh, traditionally considered part of the acoustic treatment, but I have ceramic tile in this room so the rug certainly helps to tame the reflections that would have been coming off of that ceramic tile. Uh, it's covered mostly by the rug, so it, it definitely helps to improve the acoustics of the room. And then the acoustic panels actually serve double duty, not only as acoustic panels, but also as indirect light sources. So on the panel that's above the main listening location and then hanging from the rear wall back here, I've uh, put LED light strips around the perimeter of each of those panels. So what that does is it reflects light into 
the ceiling and the rear wall that provides nice diffuse lighting back into the rest of the room. So prior to the new design where I've got the workbench at the rear of the room, there used to be bookshelves back here. So what I've done is I've built new bookshelves on either side of the room uh, and transferred all of the stuff that was on the bookshelves into the new bookshelves. Um, it turns out that books are actually pretty good acoustic absorbers and diffusers. So I actually like having some books in the room uh, because it does help the acoustics and it looks nicer than just typical uh, acoustic panels. So pro tip for you, if you're looking to tame the acoustics of a room, but you don't necessarily like the look of acoustic panels, put up some bookshelves and throw some books on there. They, they help a bunch. And then the main bugaboo for me is cable management. So I hate seeing cables that drop down behind desks and running along floors. So I've designed the custom furniture such that everything that comes out of either a keyboard or a computer element drops down behind the desk so that you can't see it. And then I've added an extra tall baseboard around the perimeter of the room. So a typical baseboard is two and a half or three inches high, something like that. But if you use a five inch baseboard, what you can do is cut off the bottom three inches or so of the drywall that's behind the baseboard, and then you can cram all of your cables in there and push the baseboard up against the wall with the cables behind it. So you can't see the cables. So what'll happen is all of the cables will drop down behind this main uh, desk location. They'll run behind the baseboard here, all the way along this wall, and then back behind the, the, the workbench at the rear of the room uh, so that you won't see the cables anywhere. And this bookshelf also serves double duty in that the lower shelf is positioned at just the right height so that when you push the bookshelf against the wall, it presses that baseboard against the wall and secures the cables behind it. So that whenever you want to add or remove a cable, all that you have to do is pull the bookshelf away from the wall. That allows you to pull the baseboard away from the wall, access the cables, put one in, take one out, do whatever you need to do, then push the baseboard back against the wall and push the bookshelf back against the baseboard so that it pins it in place and keeps it there uh, looking nice flush with the wall. So uh, that actually works out really well. So that's the layout of the room. Let's get into some details on the desk and the workbench. I spent a lot of time looking at composer desks and the part that other designs get right is that putting the MIDI keyboard tray beneath the main work area is definitely the best way to go. If you try to put the MIDI keyboard and the computer keyboard and mouse on the same level, there's always one or the other that's just in an uncomfortable position. That, that just doesn't work well at all. So putting it beneath the work area is definitely the better way to go. The part that they get wrong though, is that there's no way to get that keyboard tray completely out of the way when you're not using it, the crotch squashing problem. So the solution that I came up with is simply to create a keyboard tray that slides all the way to the rear of the desk. Now in this image right here, it's shown flush with the front of the desk, but what this tray actually does is it slides back about another 13 or 14 inches so that there's no obstruction between the top of your thighs and the bottom of the main work area. So you don't have the crotch squashing problem. There's also this cutout in the front center of that tray so that when you are using the MIDI keyboard, you get a little bit of relief, but it's still not completely perfect. Now, not shown in this version of the, the model that I got from the furniture maker are two fixed drawers on either side of the desk. So this keyboard tray is sized to house an 88 key controller. It's not 75 inches wide. It's actually 50 inches wide or something like that with two fixed drawers on either side. Um, there are two 4U rack mounts at the rear left and rear right of the main work surface, and those are not affixed to the desk. So you can take those off if I ever decide I wanna to go to a completely flat work surface, I have the option to do that. The other reason I did that is my computer monitor, I like to have at about five or five and a half inches above the desk surface. So if I were to try to put a 4U rack across the entire width of that desk, that would have raised my computer monitor up a lot higher than is comfortable for me. So by having them on the left and right rear, I can place the computer monitor between the two uh, in, a, in a position that's comfortable. Uh, and by the way, that's sized for a 34 inch widescreen monitor. So uh, that 75 inch desk width is driven by that requirement to have a 34 inch widescreen monitor 
plus two for you rack mounts on either side of that monitor. And then there's a cable tray beneath the desk at the rear that holds all of the cables that drop down from the stuff on top of the desk. And there's a modesty panel in front of that tray so that you can't see all of those cables. And then all those cables go from that cable tray down behind that baseboard that I talked about earlier in the video and around to the rear of the room. So you don't see any of that cable mess anywhere. It's all hidden uh, either behind the furniture or behind that baseboard. And then the desk is made of three quarter inch birch. There are no plastics or laminates that are gonna peel away in five years. Um, so I think this design provides something that is both functional and nice to look at. Now, as I mentioned earlier, at the rear of the room, I've got a 124 inch uh, wide by 26 inch deep workbench that is 28 inches tall. So the reason that the workbench at the rear of the room is 28 inches versus the 30 inches of the main desk is that I'm accounting for those extra couple of inches that you get when you put the MIDI keyboard or the synthesizer on top of that workbench. So now the keyboard that you're using, that you're jamming on, is at a height that's comfortable. If you go measure a standard grand piano, uh, the tops of the keys are 29 or 30 inches, somewhere around there. So this setup at the rear is set up to be ergonomically good for what I'm using that setup as, and that's for the MIDI keyboards. So you can see I've got three open bays here beneath this main work surface. I don't know if I'm gonna use those. I might wind up just putting drawers in there. That's still uh, a little bit TBD at this point but certainly the remainder of those bays beneath the open bays here, up here at the top will have drawers in them. They're sized so that I can stash 61 key keyboards in there. Um, the other key feature in this design is this cable pass through beneath the center column of drawers here. So there's a two inch gap beneath the drawers uh, between the drawers and the floor so that you can take all your cables for your foot pedals, run them underneath that uh, drawer stack and back up the wall behind the desk there uh, or behind the workbench there. So all of those cables that you have running from foot pedals, they don't need to run along the floor and up the wall and onto the top of the desk. They can go behind and come up behind it so that you don't have that cable mess. The other thing I put together for this setup were these reversible risers right here. What they do is they give you a way to raise the keyboards up and angle them towards you when you're sitting at the desk. What they also do is let you flip them over so that if you wanna stand and play, they give you about a six inch rise, which is pretty comfortable if you like to stand and play um, the keyboard. So the, they let you flip them over, you can pull off the little wedge part, flip them over and use them for a standing setup as well. Uh, and they're made of three inch square poplar that you can get at your favorite home improvement store. All right, so there's the plan. Some of that information might be specific to my way of working, but I do think there are some tidbits in there that I haven't seen discussed in other conversations about Composer Studio setups. So hopefully you found some value in those. The next step, of course, is to put this plan into action, and I'll have some videos over the next several weeks to cover that process as well. So make sure you check back if you're interested in seeing how I actually did the electrical and the lighting, how I did the cable runs, and then, of course, the final furniture installation and setup of everything within the studio. A good way to make sure you catch all of that, of course, is to subscribe to the channel. So feel free to do so. And a like on the video helps me a bunch with the YouTube algorithm. So until next time, there's music to be made. Go make it.